Good morning, everyone. If you would stand and sing with us for our first hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Barb. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah. There's an unruly group in the back for you. Yeah. Hotel was not ideal on the way home. 
for our announcements. Uh, we have mission of the month, and I think what we're saying here is that it's your passions, and um, for as we schedule our missions for 22, uh, if you have a particular uh, ministry you would like to support our mission, then uh, get it to the list. Um, I think it's the mission committee. Yep. And uh, the mission committee will come up with the 12 that we're going to do one for each month. Yep. So that's the way we did it the last couple of years, I think. And uh, seems to be working out well. Um, things coming up is a calendar planning meeting and a church cleaning day. We will meet on this Wednesday at 6.30 uh, for Bible study. And um, caught up here. Is there any other announcements? You got anything, Ryan? I'm good. Good. She's sitting right behind me. I can't <laughs> keep an eye on her. I could be making faces um, and he wouldn't even know. Okay, so happy dollars. Rumor is that Dick ought to have a bunch of happy dollars. <laughs> Okay, good morning. Um, for those of you who don't get the Tipton paper, which we affectionately call it in my house, the Tipton tissue, <clears throat> because it's so thin, um, there's a, every, end of every week, I know I text some people these, it's looking back, and for those of you that don't have this, <clears throat> this is about the church ladies. You're, you're safe. <laughs> Um, in 1981, 40 years ago, December 24th to 30th, nine members of the Triad Extension Homemakers met at Cannery Restaurant in Westfield. Ms. Hazel, Hazel Shutt gave the guests to members of the ceramic, a ceramic Christmas ornament she had made. Mrs. John Shuck was in charge of the evening. Attending were Mrs. and Mrs. Shuck, Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Edward Alderson, Mrs. Nora Adams, Mr. and Mrs. Edwin Hawk, Mr. and Mrs. Harold Fennell, Mr. and Mrs. Dale Burton, Mr. Mrs. Mac Macondale Traxler, and Mr. and Mrs. Ralph Shuck. So it was a lot. If you're old enough to know the area, <laughs> we all, a lot of us know those names, right, Dick? Right. Okay. And then it says, the women of Liberty Baptist Church made more than 50 cheer packages to be delivered to local shut-ins and, res and residents at local nursing homes. So even 40 years ago, we were here. That was before they had hymn parties, so they had to take their husbands with them. I was in high school. <laughs> Any others? Gary, I got, I've got one, but I'll let. Are you? Who's talking? All right. Um, I'm just grateful that we uh, survived our drive home. Uh, because um, we got hit by a blizzard while we were driving and then there were trucks and semis in the ditch and so we finally decided to pull over and stay in this little teeny town um, in the middle of Iowa and Josh picked out a historic hotel which all the reviews and then there were some news articles about how it was a haunted hotel and we survived in one piece. I did not sleep well that night, but we got home. So my happy dollar is for surviving that trip home. So. Saving the best for last here. Oh goodness. 
Well, I know you're all disappointed I didn't wear my Purdue gear this morning. But it was all summer gear and I knew I'd freeze. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm going by that young lady right there, some of them red and white stripes. If if I you ever does anything worthwhile, I don't know where that'll be. But anyway, there's a tin bump spot there. Because I think anybody that wins a bowl should get something special, especially the way they look the first half. <laughs> but uh, just want you all to know that the best is yet to come. We have a basketball team, too. Once you're out of state, a bowl's a bowl, right? Let's join together in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of today and a chance to gather together even on an icy cold day. Lord, we pray that we feel your presence in this place, that it warms our hearts and our uh, minds, and that it guides and directs us more fully into who you call us to be. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite our candlelighter up at this time. today, which, oh, I moved it up really high. Oh, that's because that's where it used to be. Okay. Anyway, our scripture reading for today comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Bless the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing that comes from heaven. God chose us in Christ to be holy and blameless in God's presence before the creation of the world. God destined us to be his adopted children through Jesus Christ because of his love. This was according to his good will and plan, and to honor his glorious grace that he has given freely to us through the Son whom he loves. We have been ransomed through Jesus's, through his Son's blood, and we have forgiveness of our failures based on on his overflowing grace, which he poured out over us with wisdom and understanding. God revealed his hidden design to us, which is according to his goodwill and the plan that he intended to accomplish through his son. This is what God planned for the climax of all times, to bring all things together in Christ, the things in heaven along with the things on earth. We have also received an inheritance in Christ. We were destined by the plan of God who accomplishes everything according to his design. We are called to be an honor to God's glory because we were the first to hope in Christ. You too heard the word of truth in Christ, which is the good news of your salvation. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit because you believed in Christ. The Holy Spirit is the down payment on our inheritance, which is applied towards our redemption as God's own people, resulting in the honor of God's glory.
Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless this offering that is for the continuance of the work of this church. We ask that you bless each and every person here and our extended family and our community. In God's name we pray. Amen. Experiencing COVID, we seem to be in a rash as strong as we had last year. Okay. 
Well, we ask God to be with each of these people in their time of need and help to touch their lives and make each day a little brighter. In God's name we pray. Amen. Lord's Prayer. Lord's Prayer. Repeat with me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I am very glad to be back home again. It's nice to see all your faces and grateful that we were able to come back in one piece. That may be our last Christmas in South Dakota because my parents plan to move to Indiana before, well, my mom's dream is before the baby is born, but we'll see if, that's only another six months, so we'll see if that can happen, but um, as, as we did our Christmas traditions and did some fun, silly things, I wanted to ask you about a few Christmas traditions yourself. It may seem a little silly for some of you because I think there's a good chance a few have already taken down your Christmas tree, but we are still in the 12 days of Christmas until the 6th of January, so we'll have a little bit more Christmas fun today. So my question to you is how old were you when you first were told about Santa Claus. Does anybody remember? I don't remember that part of that. <laughs> Bless your heart, Bill. We were told by our uh, nine-year-old great-grandson's mom that he's still with us. So. Yeah, she calls it this not to us. Hmm. In my family, um. My parents weren't intending to invite Santa to our house, and um, that it was Christmas was going to be just a birthday for Jesus, and we'd get a few presents kind of a thing. And then my brother went to preschool. My older brother went to preschool and came back and told my parents, did you know about Santa Claus? We can have him come to our house and leave us presents. And so after that, my parents had to start inviting Santa to the house. That also led to us having to get a puppy at one point too, but my poor parents, so my question to you, even if you don't remember how old you were, um, do you remember any Santa traditions that your household may have had? Milk and cookies. Milk and cookies for Santa? Did, does anyone ha did Santa bring stockings for anybody? Fill your stockings? Oh, yeah. Santa only filled our stockings, except for the one year my brother got a puppy. So, uh, Oh, like actual sock stockings, and yeah, my mother cross-stitched our stockings, and so we each have like an embroidered, pretty stocking with our names on it. My sister always picked knee-high. Oh, that's smart, yeah, you could fit more things in a knee-high sock than you can normal socks. Um, I know some families, Santa's the one that brings all the gifts, um, and that the parents maybe give one or two, so it's a little bit different. I know you have to coordinate that with Santa um, to make sure you're all on the same page, but what I like about the idea of Santa Claus is the, the story behind him and his legend, because he's not just an anonymous giver, but his origins come from St. Nicholas of Mir Mira, or Myra, um, and he was a bishop in what is now modern-day Turkey. And as you can see by the, the, the icon on the far side, it gives a hint to what would become Santa Claus's future clothing. Um, but in a lot of European countries, St. Nicholas still comes to their houses in bishop clothing, like you see here, not in what we know 
as Santa Claus clothing, you know, his fur and boots and big buckled belt and everything. But this historical man lived from the late 200s to the mid 300s and was a very fascinating historical figure that defended the gospel. There's a whole thing about him punching a guy in the face because he was spreading falsities about, um, about Jesus. But, but also, he was an, an anonymous giver. He was a wealthy man who gave away his money to enable um, women who were poor to be able to get married because you had a dowry at that time. So if you were poor, it was difficult to get married because you couldn't make that transaction. Um, he also gave gifts to people in poverty. And so this man, this historical man, evolved into different traditions. And depending on the country you're in, Santa does things different to meet you in your culture. So, in Italy, um, there's a fun picture of some of the different Santa costumes, um, depending on where you're from. So, different versions of the bishop look. But in Italy, you don't celebrate on Christmas. Santa doesn't come on Christmas. He comes on December 6th, which is the Feast of St. Nicholas. So you set out a plate, um, an empty plate, not filled with stuff, an empty plate with your letter requesting your gifts for Christmas. And St. Nicholas comes and fills the plate with goodies and some little presents. And so he comes on December 6th instead of Christmas. Maybe that's why he can get all over the world in the time frame that he does, because he doesn't have to come to everybody on the 25th. But a little more controversial is in Holland, Santa still dresses in his bishop clothing, but he is accompanied by a freed slave, um, and you, instead of elves, and usually he is, when people dress up, it is not a black person dressing up as the freed slave, but um, some outdated costuming. And so some of those, their traditions in Holland have shifted, but for them, they polish and shine their boots and set them on the windowsill. And Santa leaves them nuts and treats and some chocolates and usually a pair of socks as the gift that they receive from St. Nicholas. It's fun to think about how, depending on the country you're from, Santa's able to meet you in your unique country's traditions. And to think about the, the roots of this historical man and how that has inspired anonymous giving for hundreds of years. And this idea of fun generosity. Well, I have the love of December 6th because of that. Um, but just in a few days is January 6th, Epiphany, and that's supposed to be the church's tradition of celebrating the wise men coming and giving their gifts and the declaration that Jesus is the born God in the flesh. Um, and so there's lots of fun traditions around that that I encourage you to look up. King cake is one interesting thing. Oh yes, so this is my little joke. If you can't read it, it says, the tree stays up until epiphany. You'll get used to the way things are done around here properly. Um, this is from Downton Abbey. It's, that's, she doesn't say that, but it's, yeah, it's a funny thing. But um, so we are in the season of Christmas for a few more days. So I want us to just ponder the Christmas gift of Jesus Christ for another Sunday, but from a different angle. We're going to dive into John chapter 1 and look at John's beginning of the gospel and how he shares the story of Christ coming into the world. We're going to be reading John chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. I invite you to turn with me there, and we'll talk about this together. The light was in the world, and the world came into being through the light. 
But the world didn't recognize the light. The light came to his own people, and his own people didn't welcome him. But those who did welcome him, those who believed in his name, he authorized to become God's children. Born not from blood, nor from human desire or passion, but born from God. The word became flesh and made his home among us. We have seen his glory, glory like that of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified about him, crying out, This is the one whom I said, He who comes after me is greater than me, because he existed before me. From his fullness we, all, we have all received grace upon grace. As the law was given through Moses, so grace and truth came into being through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. God, the only Son who was made, who is at the Father's side, has made God known. When I reflect on the, the beginning of the Gospel of John, I have to say that God truly gave us a gift in Scripture, and that none of the four Gospels begin the same way. And I think that God does this intentionally for us to get a full picture. Because if we, in order to hear the Christmas story, we need to combine the beginning of Matthew and Luke together to get that story, because both of them have intentions of um, talking about Matthew with the, the Jewish prophecies and connecting that to Jesus of Nazareth, and Luke with the historical events connecting that to Jesus of Nazareth. And then Mark doesn't even mention a Christmas story at all, because his was the first gospel, and his intention was get it out there as fast as possible. So he wrote things down and started with John the Baptist as a grown man. We don't need to skip through from a baby to an adulthood and blah, blah, blah. He's like, no, just get it out there. Let people hear it as soon as possible. Keep it short and simple. Get the basic points down. And then John, John being its own gospel in itself, is the most unique out of the three. The other three kind of have similar landing points. But John's intention was to point to the fact that Jesus was God. And so throughout his gospel, he will keep pointing to miracles or signs that point to Jesus being divine. Not just human, but divine. And so his beginning doesn't start with the birth of a child, but starts at the beginning of all creation. In the beginning was the word, is what the very first line of John 1 starts with. Because he wants you to think of Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He wants you to think of that. And so John connects creation with the fact that Christ was present at that time and that God's plans haven't changed. That Christ was there from the beginning, Christ's plans, and God's plans have been consistent about reuniting all the creation back to God. That Jesus is God, dwelling with his people to fulfill those promises. I love that the language of the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the, the interesting thing is that this idea wasn't the first time that people at this time would have heard something like this. Um, in a mixed society, if Jews were anywhere near Greeks or Romans, they would have heard of Zeus. And Zeus wandered around with humans, at least in legends, usually with unwed women, causing problems for those unwed women. I'll leave that to you to fill in the gaps. But this God made flesh was different not coming for their, his own entertainment or benefit, but for the benefit of all of humanity and creation. A great reuniting, a great healing. That heaven and earth would both be included in this. 
This God is different and does things in a different way. And I like this image that this Jesus of Nazareth was a different type of God. Not a God that did things for their own amusement, because that's what would have been heard of Roman gods or Greek gods or even Egyptian gods. They, they did things for their own benefit, not for the benefit of their people. But this God, Yahweh, who sends his son, these intentions aren't for God, but for creation to be benefited. And then it says that Jesus came to pour out grace upon grace. And anytime you see a repetitive language in scripture, it's like them trying to say the maximum amount. Like if you hear King of Kings, Lord of Lords, uh, something like that, the point is to say the top, the cream of the crop, the best, the fullest you can do. And so in here we see that this Jesus, God made flesh, comes to pour out grace upon grace, the fullness of grace. Not temporary grace. Not conditional grace. But the fullness of grace is poured out. This God's different. And John's story starts it from the very beginning. And this gift of being able to see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and combine all of their stories together to get this full picture of Jesus as the fulfilling Jewish Messiah, as this man who came and healed as a man, as divine who came and healed as divine, who is this historical figure, and we get this full picture of what a gift it was. And the best part of this gift is that Merry Christmas also means welcome to the family. That with the gift of this child, word made flesh, who becomes a man who does life and ministry, who dies and is resurrected, is that that means that there is an open invitation for all people to be part of the family and that someday all of creation will be healed as well. Particularly, something that stands out to me is in verse 13, where it says that we are God's children, born not of blood or of passions or of human desires, but from God. That it's not something we did, but entirely on God. And if you read a few verses earlier, it says that all we had to do was believe, and then we are... God's children. But I think that church tradition has shifted over the years, kind of like how the traditions of Santa Claus have shifted over the years, and we've added some stuff to the, to, in order to become the family of God. We've got these benchmarks that we put in place. It's like we want to know if you're serious or not, so we add these little things. Depending on your denomination you grew up in, there's more or less steps. But here, at the beginning of John, there's no prayer that needs to be prayed. There's no communion that needs to be taken. There's no class Christian 101 that you need to take. It's simply belief. Period. And you are a child of God. What a gift. Grace upon grace being poured out to all who believe. And if you want to walk with me for a minute, it's interesting because I feel like tradition has shifted in the way we operate as Christians across the world. And I want to give a specific example here. There is this um, scientist named Abraham Maslow who created a theory called the hierarchy of needs. And the general premise is that there's like, 
the, and that each human has a basic set of needs. And in order to get to the more advanced ones, you have to work through the bottom rungs first. There's a pyramid graphic that I can show you. There's not? All right, there's not a pyramid graphic. Yes, but the bottom rung is, um, is about like your basic human needs. Food, clothing, water, shelter, basic needs. The next one would be your concept of safety, both physical safety and mental safety. And then as you go up from there, it gets more complex to the very top being about how you better yourself, like your own perceptions of who you are and what that looks like and what you intend to do is at the very top. And this, I, the, the interesting thing is, um, so Matt, his theory is that you have to deal with basic needs before you can ever expect to get to the top to deal with like transformation of self. That stuff can't happen if people are, uh, their lives are unbalanced. And so, but the irony is, so frequently ministries flip it and they want to fix you first before you get the stuff. And the specific example of that I think of is in my hometown, there is a homeless shelter that in order to get food, clothing, or shelter, you have to first hear the gospel message and an opportunity to pray a prayer of salvation before you can ever get food. Before you can have a bed to sleep in that night. And this theory says that's never going to work because people can't comprehend that stuff when they're unstable. When you're hungry and you can't think straight. When you're scared, you can't think straight. And to expect them to transform their lives when their basic needs aren't met is impossible. And then we look at how Jesus operates his ministry. And he shows up and cares for pe people's basic needs first. He feeds them. He heals them. He casts out demons. He, he does these basic things. And if they stick around, not always, but if they stick around, then he gives them lessons of transformation. The ones that come back and say, thank you. Or the ones that stick around and say, what can I do? He then gives them a lesson of transformation. But it's not always people who have none that have these same lessons. Sometimes it's the excess that needs to be balanced in that bottom tier. And a rich man comes to Jesus and says, what do I, what can I do for eternal life? I mean, the truth is, believe. Right? But Jesus says to him, Sell all your possessions and give everything to the poor. And he walks away sad because he had a lot of stuff. And so he couldn't get to the salvation point because he was stuck on that bottom tier holding on to his excess. And so it was still that bottom tier that was preventing him from understanding. But it was excess rather than less that held him back. Yet Jesus met people at that bottom rung all the time. And if they stuck around, called them to something deeper. As followers of God, we are called to not put prerequisites on grace. Jesus' gift of grace upon grace is poured out to all who believe. You don't have to have a perfect life to get that grace. You don't have to have gipped up and cleaned up every sin that you've ever had to get that grace. You don't have to have God all figured out to get that grace. It's there for you, period. And sometimes that makes us uncomfortable because it's like, this is such a special gift, we need to put prerequisites on it, right? Like, we need to make sure people earn it. But God's like, nope. Not going to do that. This is poured out for anyone. He authorized those who believed in his name to become children of God, born not 
from blood, nor from human desire or passion, but born from God. I have to admit, it's quite a relief. So when we hear Merry Christmas, it's like this promise of welcome to the family at the same time. God's opening the doors, opening his table, and saying, I want you. Come on in. Others may question whether you should be here or not. But me, God made flesh, says, nope, come. We'll take care of your basic needs first, and the rest will come later. One step at a time. And so today, um, it seems fitting that for us to start this new year off with a family meal. And I'm sure some of you are like, oh, I'm so full. Um, how can I fit another meal inside of me? But today's meal is a symbolic meal of bread and of juice to remind us that we are part of the family. That the promise of Christmas is poured out for all and that there's no conditions attached. No matter what baggage you carry, no matter what struggles you're dealing with, the door is open. And that as we as believers who are in the know are there to open the invitations and trust that God will take care of the other layers, the other parts of the pyramid, as we continue to pour out God's love on them. The rest is God's job. Our job is to open the doors. So, today, no conditions attached. You are invited to the table. You're invited to the family to have the bread representing Christ's body and the juice representing Christ's blood to remind us of what promises we are to receive and that everything is in God's hands. We only need to believe. I'm going to invite our deacons up to serve communion. Because I have been traveling, I am not going to come close to the communion stuff, just as an added precaution for all of you. I just want to be cautious there. So they'll come up and grab their plates and bless the, off, the, the communion, and you'll be invited to receive that, okay? So I'll invite our deacons forward. We ask that God bless this bread, which represents the body of Christ. As we come out of the Christmas season, help us to remember and to be constantly aware of the sacrifice of his body for us. In God's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah.
Christ's body and blood. Do this in remembrance. Let's stand together and sing our closing benediction.